Gary DePaul with Unlabeled Leadership. Welcome to episode 22, Lisa Wicker meets you where you are. Let's get started. 2021 is gonna be another year in which women shatter the limits. In fact, capacity, women shattering the limits now is the title of Lisa's forthcoming book. I think capacity is an appropriate word because it really is not about the capacity you have now, but how you develop that capacity. What you're about to hear are stories that Lisa shares about how she developed her capacity to be able to do what she does now, which is champion women, celebrate their successes, and actively help them develop their own capacity. But I should note, it's not about just women becoming better professionals. No, it's more about helping them be able to add value to their communities, the companies they work at, and even in their families. Yes, Lisa is a trailblazer. She's a successful businesswoman. But more than that, she serves a higher purpose, a purpose of adding to the world rather than detracting from it. Part one, showing respect for who you are. Sometimes, it only takes one person to believe in who you are to put you in the right position for you to excel. But even then, you're relying on other people to help you along the way. And these aren't handouts, they're hand-ups. It's about mentoring and stewarding and helping other people grow. It's because of those people, your environment, and your own ingenuity that gets you to the place where you need to be to accelerate to accomplish, and to be successful. Lisa Wicker gets this because she's helped thousands of people along their path, but now you're going to hear some stories about how some people have helped her. Here's Lisa now. Well, something that someone told me, particularly um, throughout my career, I've had great mentors. Uh, I've been blessed enough to have some, some powerful mentors, and one of them told me several things as I have uh, talked with them about my career and leading. In particular, I remember and recall one of them saying that great leaders actually show respect by meeting people where they are and accepting them for who they are in light of whatever the situation is. And that always stuck with me because much of my career, I was the youngest in environments leading teams And I've come across a number of situations where I did have to recall that phrase to meet what people where they are, because people will not always be and meet our expectations. And so we have to kind of step back to step forward. For me, it's carried me through part of my mantra, which is lead by example, Mm. as well as are your leader worth following? And I constantly keep those things in mind. Because people are always observing you, whether you realize it or not, if you can keep those things in mind, you'll be better for it. And in fact, when, when you do those things, the visions that you have to be that leader and where you want to carry people or have influence to have them follow you becomes much easier. Those are some things that I've kept with me along the way in terms of my mentors and what has helped me to I hopefully be a leader worth following. Yeah, these are your guiding principles that keep you on your path, so to speak, your compass. Right, right, absolutely. Basically, we can talk about, you know, how that actually played out in particularly an example of of the leadership. You're you're ahead of me. You're you're right on. That was (laughs) the next thing I was going to say is uh, give me an example. Yeah, so I'll take you back to my career, if I could talk a little bit, you know, I started in the automotive industry at 21, uh, coming right out of college. And I did not start in a, an assembly operation. In fact, I started in a foundry. So if anyone knows what a foundry is like, it's, it's not the sexiest part of the automotive industry. I became a supervisor at 21 for the operation that I was responsible for with over 60 or 70 people working for me at that time. And so fresh out of college, you think you know everything. It really became an opportunity for me to learn very quickly, very fast. And what I mean by that, I learned in those jobs and times, working second shift in hot environments uh, with people that were much older than me, 
that I had to listen and that I had to understand how to meet people where they are. And fast forward to after several promotions and having an opportunity to work at the world headquarters of General Motors, I was given an opportunity to actually go to the assembly operation and become the head of uh, labor relations for a negotiations year. And that particular year, when I walked into that facility as the individual responsible for uh, labor relations, I had such an awakening because the team that I was going to lead did not want me to be there. Okay. Uh, in fact, they were offended that I had been sent to negotiate the contract because I had come from the world headquarters. They somehow thought I was a spy and all these unnecessary uh, attributes that certainly should not have been attached to me. They were given to me, not, and even the names were not so pretty, right? Yep. And so I had one individual, I'll call him Jake. And, and Jake did everything he could to go out of his way to make my time there miserable. He would not log in the information in our books that we track, you know, the grievances. He would uh, show up to meetings late. He would have an attitude, wouldn't speak. It was just becoming to, uh, it, it became a sore in my, my side each day to even have to go into work because I knew I was going to have to deal with Jake. And finally, I decided, you know what, there's something more to this than it has to do with me. And while I'm leading, they're not following me. And I need to figure out what I can do to turn this around. So I decided to look at me. Was there something that I needed to change with respect to how I was leading? Or is it because I just showed up that they didn't like me? So one day I went into the office and I stood over his desk and I said, do you mind if we can take a walk through the through the plan? I'd just like to, to have a chat with you. He said, sure. And so we began to walk through the, the operations and I said, you know, I, I don't know what it is that is not working for you with respect to wanting to work on my team, but I would like to start over if we can. And if you could share with me where you are right now with respect to your desires and what it is that you are trying to accomplish and how can I help? Because I, I don't know where to start with you. And he looked at me, he says, wow, why do you care? I said, well, I mean, I don't know you, you don't know me, we should start somewhere. All of us have desires to have careers and I would just like to know what are your desires and, and what it is that I can do to help. But more importantly, how can we work together? And he stopped and he said, you know, you're the first person that I've ever worked for to even ask me that question to even bring about the idea that maybe you care. He says, I've never had a supervisor who even remotely stopped to even address my name, let alone ask me what I want to get out of my job or my career. He says, and part of why I'm not receiving you well is you are sent here on a career path of a high develop developer, high flyer, you're going to come through here and you're going to be promoted to the next job. And I'm still sitting in the same job. I've been trying to get promoted for the last five or six years. I can show you a hundred job self applications that I put in for jobs that I've not received one interview. And you are asking me what it is that I'd want to do. Wow. He said, that's amazing. In fact, I don't even know if I can trust you, but since you asked me, let me tell you. And, and so the story goes that I met him where he was. I met him at the point in where he was at that moment. And truly, I had no idea that that very conversation would allow him to accept me for who I was and to build that trust so that I could get respect, but also respect him to empower him to be able to accomplish some of the things that he wants. And within the, the next six to eight months, we built a great relationship. And I was able to help him move out of that assignment to the next assignment. To me, it was a success. But it taught me a lot about you cannot think as a leader, people are just going to accept you because you show up. You really have to understand how to set the tone and the mood of the environment so people will follow you. And when people feel like there's a trusting platform to do that, you both will win. You said some amazing things. And what really struck out was when Jake 
said, why do you care? In that one question, there were so many assumptions, beliefs about you that he attributed to you without cause. In other words, he stereotyped you as the supervisor and treated you as you were a supervisor without even getting to know you and based on past experiences. Yeah, he was angry. He was angry and I received all of that coming into the position. I had to deal with that for several, several months until I made a decision that I could no longer do this and I needed to actually get to know him along with the others, but he was the toughest one. So I figured it, I had to start at the toughest one to kind of change the apple orchard, you know? Yeah. So that uh, the one rotten or the one that was just the most sour or the one that really would spoil it for everybody else would help me turn everything around. And it did actually. Part two, why do you care? Do you appreciate the people who come work for you or work with you? Do you see in them a potential that they don't even see? And do you show the gratitude that you have for working with these people on a regular basis? Is the answer sort of, kind of, yeah, in my own way? We all could do a better job of appreciating and championing those around us. And in this story, Lisa shares how one person in particular helped champion her. Again, here's Lisa. When I was at um, General Motors, as I mentioned to you, started my career in um, Saginaw, Michigan in a foundry at Chevrolet. And I got promoted to come to the powertrain division, which that promotion was taking me to a larger organization and more responsibility. So I went from seven plant locations where I was responsible for training in Saginaw, Michigan. And then I got promoted to the general manager of training and development for powertrain, which was 28 plant locations, that particular operation. And the lady that I joined, uh, her name was Mary. Mary invited me to be on her team, but I learned so much from Mary because of her disposition. She, to me, how can I say it? She exemplified the epitome of a true cheerleader okay. for her employees. When I accepted the job, I remember, and I can see it today, when I accepted the job and I went to her, you know, her office, I had uh, driven from Saginaw, Michigan to Pontiac, Michigan, which is over an hour or so to accept the position. She literally took my hand and began to jump up and down with me in her office, like little girls. Oh gosh, Do you understand? I love it. Like little girls. She said, I can't believe you accepted a job and just grabbed me and just start jumping. And I'm looking at her like, oh my gosh, you know, I wasn't expecting that. Here I am coming from, you know, the small town of Saginaw to a group location now, which was a, a huge promotion for me, to a, a supervisor or leader that was actually exemplifying the excitement of my joining her team. As I began to work for her, I felt every day that I actually would go to work head first to get there. Like if I were playing baseball, I would go for head first to, to get to, to work because I was driving an hour from Saginaw to Pontiac in the snow because I didn't move right away. I did that for almost a half a year. But I felt like it was nothing for me to do that because her leadership principles and her leadership style was one that not only used everyone's talents within the team, but she showed us that she was cheering us on. And quite honestly, I only stayed with Mary for maybe eight months because I was quickly promoted to the world headquarters because Mary was that type of cheerleader. She saw that I had stayed, actually she told me too long in Saginaw, I should have been in the world headquarters long before just based upon what she thought my skill set was. I say to me, to, to me, her attributes and, and her behavior exemplified the kind of leader that I wanted to become because I felt like everyone on the team worked harmoniously and the examples that she was setting for us was that there was nothing we could achieve, that she was not going to support us and get us there. I mean, to me, that's the type of leader that 
sets the mood and the tone of the organization. She worked hand in hand with Dr. Deming, which I had a chance to work with him personally because of her leadership, uh, which is, you know, today, you know, most people won't know what we're talking about when we're talking about Dr. Deming for, for quality and uh, leadership within organizations. Okay, you're talking about the Deming. The Deming. I worked with him personally. Oh, wow. Yes. And that's because of her leadership. She was never the type of person that you know, as some leaders would say, you know, that's not the place you need to be. That's where I need to be. No, she ensured that we got the exposure, the opportunity, and the ability to learn from the best. And those are days that I remember as to why excellence matters to me. And the discipline of leadership was taught to in my early years of what it looks like. When you talk about Mary, I get the impression and I guess you kind of clarified it with your story, that she does not approach people with a neutral stance that, okay, we'll see what, what you have to offer, for example. <laughs> you know, it's, I believe in you. I know you're going to do great. And she encourages the people that she works with to grow and develop and to change. And she is there every step of the way. I bet, yeah. I bet she removes obstacles. She did. And shows you the door of opportunity that you may never have seen. Well, again, like I said, I was only with her eight months. I went from what I call a supervisor to general manager to an executive in less than a year and a half at General Motors World Headquarters because she didn't stand in the way. She made sure that, like, I should not have been able to interview for that position because I'd only been with her eight months. But someone asked who on your team do you think is ready for this? And she popped my name up and I got an interview. And the next thing I know, I was down at, in Detroit at the world headquarters working now two steps away from the CEO and chairman of General Motors. One of the beliefs, leadership beliefs, and I, I have a list of them somewhere. When you encourage people to grow and leave their role, doing that contributes to organizational growth. Yes, I believe that. Absolutely. I mean, I, I've always been that person. I hope I ended up being somewhat similar to Mary and, and the team and people that I worked for enjoyed working with me and making things happen. But I would always suggest that you want people to either grow to grow out and out of the organization or grow to grow wider within the organization. And that has always been my mantra. If I felt like I needed to hold on uh, and be insecure and certainly not open to learning from my team. I've always felt like the team could teach me a, a whole lot more than I could teach them because the sum of them were greater than my myself. And at the end of the day, uh, my job really was to be able to open up the opportunities for all of those skills and the capacity that they have would be able to to show up and be used every day. That That was my intent. And that's the kind of leaders that I, majority of leaders that I've worked for. I've, learned, I've worked for a few that, that certainly taught me how not to lead. But the ones <laughs> we, that yeah. I, <laughs> the we ones, all have been there. Yeah, the ones that, that came to mind, like it's been over, what, 30 years since, you know, I've worked for Mary, 20, maybe 25 years. So for me to, to talk about her today tells you that, you know, she left a lasting impact on what I think leaders should be like. Part three, why do you want a promotion? For many of us, starting a new job is the honeymoon period. Everything is great, nothing's wrong. Then later, everything is good. Then later, everything's okay. And then later, well, it's time for a change. What gets us to that point, to it's time for a change, but why? Why do we want to change? Especially if we want to move up to a higher position with more managerial responsibilities. Lisa has some ideas about this. Here's Lisa. As I think about advice that I give to people, why I think this particular piece of advice is important is that I often said to people that I was mentoring or people that would ask me, how did I master my career and how did I uh, have the opportunity to 
be successful. To me, success is relative, but if you're in a leadership role or you want to be a leader, there are several things that I, I often ask people. And one of them is, why do you want to lead? And most of the time when I ask people that, they don't have an answer. They just said, well, I, it's time. I'm a high potential or I've been in this job so long. It's now time to be promoted. And that's not the answer. That's really not the answer. And I challenged them and, and I got to that space of asking people that because my mentor did that to me. I credit him today for that very question of wanting to get a promotion, walking into his office and saying, you know, I need help and I'm not getting promoted. And he would say, well, why do you want to be in that job? Why are you trying to get, be the leader? And he challenged me for at least two to three weeks until I got the right answer. And I still didn't get the answer. He finally gave it to me that it really comes down to most people wanting to be in those leadership roles because they uh, want the authority to be able to make decisions. But you cannot make decisions without people that are following those decisions or giving you a voice or a place to have the authority and the brand identity to use your capacity to that point in time that people really get and get on board with uh, your being the leader. And so the advice that I tell people particularly, Gary, is that you have to actually practice and demonstrate specific leader behaviors. Okay, yeah. You have to consciously practice them. In other words, I affirm and I often tell people, today you must tell yourself, I choose to use these specific leader behaviors. And on the day that I gave you that example with Jake, I made a decision to come to his level, to use the behavior of meeting people where they are. That's a really good example of leadership not having anything to do with authority. What made the difference was how you approached him, what you said, that had nothing to do with your position, the power you had that was given to you by the organization. What really made the difference was how you led. Yeah, and, and was really, are you a leader worth following? Now, the, the piece for the authority really comes in that you still have a job to do as a leader. Am I right? Yes. And those things that you have authority to make decisions on, none of them are going to work if you have no one to work with. <laughs> <laughs> none of them. So at the end of the day, all of it comes together, but it's really about someone and the team wanting to follow you and you cheering them on and you're being in their corner and you're helping to develop them to get to the place that they feel that they're using their talents and they have an opportunity to contribute at their highest level. My thanks to Lisa Wicker for joining us. If you want to learn more about Lisa, go to the show notes for links. If you have a question or comment, go to unlabelleadership.com, find the message icon, click it and leave up to a one minute message. Maybe I'll play it on the air in a later episode. Thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Until next time, lead on.